Alrighty. Hello, everybody. I'm Steve. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. This is my first time in India. I came a very long way. I've been doing a lot of flying this month in general. Uh, I would love to be here a lot longer, and luckily they give you like a six-month visa, so hopefully I can come back before December. We'll see. Um, one of the funny parts about doing a lot of travel like I do is that uh, when I time to come vacation, I just want to stay at home. Right, so people are like, oh, you can come back on vacation. And I'm like, the last thing I want to do is get on a plane for another 14 hours or 20 hours, right? So um, anyway, yeah. So this is a talk. Uh, it's sort of about functional reactive programming, but it's also sort of not about functional reactive programming. So um, let's get into it. So with Frappuccino, I don't mean this kind of Frappuccino, um, even though they are delicious. Uh, there's a Ruby gem that I have written called Frappuccino. Um, and so I'm going to talk to you today about building this Ruby gem, um, why I built it, and a whole bunch of other stuff. I also, um, Frappuccino is part of this series that sort of became a little miniature meme. Um, a lot of us were at um, Red Dot Ruby Conf in Singapore a couple weeks ago, and I think Aaron actually started saying irresponsible Ruby um, is this tagline, but this talk is largely about um, being irresponsible with Ruby and why I think that we need to be more irresponsible with our Ruby code. Um, and the last part is sort of a little bit of this talk is about killing your idols. So, for example, I saw a tweet. Someone said, like, I just talked to Tenderlove today, and he's like a real person. And I think that, uh, and it's funny because, like, before I was friends with Aaron, I thought the same exact thing, right? So we're all just people in this room. Just because I'm on stage does not mean that, you know, um, I'm anything special. So uh, I think that it's really important that we don't develop a celebrity culture, even though we sort of kind of have one. But I'm interested in not having that uh, work out. So um, this talk is sort of, um, it's about a Ruby gem that I built named Frappuccino. I don't really know how it's useful exactly, but I'm going to get up here and talk to you about it today anyway, because one of the weird things about giving talks is you, you only get to see the finished, final, polished output, right? So um, if I had written a Ruby gem and I wanted to share it with you guys, I would spend hours building this gem and doing a lot of development work and struggling with bugs, and then at the very end I would give this presentation where it's all so completely obvious, right? And you could just see how this Ruby code just works but you don't get to see the hours and hours of struggle that goes into like everyday programming, right, that we all do together. Um, I've been doing a lot of remote pair programming lately, and um, there was a, a bug in rescue that me and someone were trying to fix, and we wrote a test, and it was failing, and we tried to fix it, and the test still failed, and we tried to fix it, and the test still failed, and eventually they like apologized to me. They're like, I'm really sorry, we can't get this passing, I'm sure this is very boring for you. And I was like, I don't know what you think I do all day, but I try to make my test pass, and then they don't pass a lot. Um, so we're all in this together, I guess is what I'm saying. And so uh, just because I'm on stage does not actually mean that it's all put together entirely. So in this talk, um, I will be doing a little bit of live coding and some demos. And uh, I'm using this really interesting presentation software called Rabbits. Um, because uh, one of the funny things is that I recently ditched Mac OS for Linux again entirely. Um, uh, I would like to say that it's actually due to the actions of my government, but that's not really true. It just happened to happen at the same time, so, you know, whatever. But, um, and when I mean ditched, I mean, like, I gave my MacBook away, so I don't have a Mac anymore at all. And what's funny about this is that, like, last time I gave this talk, um, I realized when I went, I was like, oh, yeah, totally, I need to give this talk, uh, RubyConf India, awesome. Um, I'll just use the same thing that I had from Singapore two weeks ago. But in those two weeks, I gave my Mac away, so my keynote slides that are saved on my iCloud are, like, not accessible whatsoever. Um, so if you saw this talk there, or if you watched the video, this is actually a different iteration on this talk. And I'm using um, Rabbit, which is super fun. So there's a little tortoise that's walking across for the 45 minutes, and the hair is my slides. Um, so anyway, so this presentation is a little rough, um, but that's sort of on purpose. Like, I would like to show you what my thought process is while I'm building this kind of software. Um, I don't want to show you a totally finished project. I don't want everything to be perfect because the world is never perfect, right? So please excuse the eventual technical errors that will happen. Uh, yeah, because that's just, that's just going to happen. Um, OK, so what is irresponsible Ruby? In the last two weeks, I've like, developed this into like, a philosophy. It's really silly. Um, so. Uh, irresponsible Ruby is Ruby code that you would not deploy at your day job because it's just too interesting or creative. I think that's like the summary that I've gotten. Uh, you know, 
I developed this whole thing like out of this gist that Aaron wrote. Um, but um, so basically, irresponsible Ruby consists of a bunch of neat hacks, weird meta programming, unusual techniques, and no unit tests. Um, and actually, depending on how fast I go, because I speak very quickly, and I apologize um, if, you know, if I speak too fast, just the way that happens when I get nervous, I speak even more quickly. So um, if, if I go super fast, I actually have a second irresponsible Ruby gem that I will show you um, if, I, if I do it too quickly. But um, I think that this last no unit test thing is important. And the, I'll talk a little bit about the various parts of this. But when I say unit test, I mean unit test specifically. I think that um, so all of my irresponsible Ruby code has acceptance tests because I would like it to work, right? But I don't want to constrain myself on how I make it work. So I think that a regression suite is totally cool, but like developing the code via TDD is not, re it's responsible, not irresponsible. Um, okay, so this story, yeah, like many others, those of you who are clapping, you know who this is. If you do not know who this is, this is Why the Lucky Stiff, a member of the Ruby community who did a bunch of really interesting things uh, and then left. Um, that's sort of a summary, yeah. So there's this uh, blog post uh, that someone wrote where after Y had disappeared, um, for those of you like, who didn't know, yeah, Y disappeared and quit. I talked to a lot of people who are new to Ruby at this conference, that's great. But it means that when I reference people who like, quit five years ago, they don't know. Um, also, I should make an asterisk here too. I brought this up um, at, at Red Dot, and I'll bring this up again too. I had someone tell me one time that um, they'll be happy to go to a Ruby conference where the names Why the Lucky Stiff and Zed Shaw are not mentioned whatsoever. And Jim brought up Zed, so I can bring up Y. So now we have a 1 1 Y Z ratio um, years later after these two people quit Ruby. So then the problem is when you talk about it, it like, you know, I mentioned both of them, right? So anyway, so. After Y disappeared, um, this person realized that they had written an email to Y uh, a long time ago. And so they wrote this blog post. If you Google for a letter from Y, um, you can see the content of this post. Um, and here is some text from the, the email that Y, this person emailed Y and they said, hey Y, how can I become a better programmer? Should I like, what testing framework should I use? Like, should I use Rails? Like, what, what should I do? How, how can I get better at Ruby? This is what Y said. Um, is an abbreviated version. Um, I do not write tests for my code. I do not write very many comments. I change styles very frequently. And most of all, I shun the predominant styles of coding because that would go against the very essence of experimentation. In short, all I do is muck around. <laughs> I admire programmers who take risks. They aren't afraid to write dangerous or crappy code. If you worry too much about being clean and tidy, you can't push the boundaries. Until an asteroid, why? Um, <laughs> which is like a great ending, right? So, uh, so to give you some historical context, why quit programming uh, or quit us or quit everything um, on August 17th, 2009? And um, myself and some other people took over his projects. And this blog post, I believe, uh, came out uh, in 2011. So it's like two years into Y's disappearance. And I had been maintaining the uh, wise code for those last two years, and in fact, been incredibly, ridiculously frustrated by it. Like, I got burned out trying to take over his code. Um, and so I saw this blog post hit the top of Hacker News, and I went, oh no, oh no. <laughs> um, so if you go to that blog post today, you'll see the very first comment on the page is me. Um, As someone who maintains wise code these days, please write some tests. So at the time, yeah, I was like, oh no, I, I'm spending all of this effort um, figuring out what he did and like trying to make it work. Um, and uh, basically, if, if you read the 100-page PDF that Y gave to us uh, recently, um, he actually explicitly says, like, I got sick of rebooting into Mac and testing, rebooting into Linux and testing, rebooting into Windows and testing, nulls, you know, com destroyed my life, like, programming is terrible. Um, and so I was like seeing like, oh, this person is suggesting that Y is telling us we all need to do that same thing that caused him to burn out. Like, oh my God, no, we can't do this. But after some more time has gone on, um, I think that in the end, actually, Y was right. But I think I was right too, actually. Um, I, I think at the mo in the moment, you know, I was very super concerned uh, about people taking on this irresponsible um, attitude. But now, I'm not actually sure that, I think we may be too responsible 
right? So, and that may have to do with why leaving, or that may have to do with the fact that Ruby has grown a ton. Um, you know, uh, Ruby has always been on sort of this massive growth streak, right? So people will tell you about like the good old days before Rails in the Ruby world where everyone knew each other and it was super tiny and you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, I, don't, I think that nostalgia for the past is useful, but is not always like accurate, right? Everything's rose-colored when you look at it. Um, but um, I do think that maybe in our interests for like startup stuff and our concerns with engineering and all this, all these things, like you know, Ruby has grown up into the enterprise and it's a big deal now. Uh, so that means we lose a little bit of that like quirkiness and interestingness that happened before we needed to, uh, you know, deploy websites that hundreds of thousands of dollars of transactions would go through or that, you know, your, your coworkers are relying on your code to not have a job, right? So I help maintain rescue nowadays and uh, rescue processes credit card transactions for living social. And so my programmer brain is very good at coming up with uh, worst possible scenarios, right? So in my brain, I'm like, oh my God, if I push a commit to rescue that breaks it, credit card transactions won't get processed and my friends won't get paid and their kids will start and like, you know, it just like goes into this, you know, really ridiculous uh, disaster scenario, right? Where in reality, Living Social will just make some more shady investment deals and take another like $100 million and like they'll pay their bills, it's fine. Um, but, you know, this sort of like stress, um, you know, I've started working on Rails in the last year, right? And so um, I helped put together the 2.3.13 release that caused GitHub to email all of their clients, uh, you know, their, uh, all their clients and their enterprise, uh, basically, they emailed, instead of BCCing everyone, there was a bug, an active record that popped up that we didn't have a test for and nobody knew it would happen, where uh, instead of it being like to GitHub BCC everyone, it was to everyone, right? So everyone knows everyone who has bought GitHub Enterprise now, which is like not cool, and that's like sort of indirectly half my fault, right? So, uh, so this is kind of stressful, right? When you're working on software at scale, um, you have this big sense of responsibility. I, this is why I wanted to work on open source, because like, uh, it's scalable, right? So if I work on Rails, I can help hundreds of thousands of people. The problem is that if I screw up, I screw up things for hundreds of thousands of people. So, um, so that urge to be responsible um, limits us in many ways. And I think that, the, that ultimately, while I'm sort of presenting the irresponsible side today, I think that we need both very seriously, right? So I'm not suggesting that you should instantly throw away all of your tests and go home and go crazy and do whatever you want. Um, I'm suggesting that we're, we're programmers, we build things, we produce stuff, right? So um, when we produce things, we need to think about the way in which we produce things. And there are multiple ways of producing everything, right? So, if you need to build a bridge, you are like fundamentally constrained by the laws of physics and like the materials you can get access to for like money or whatever. As programmers, we can like dream up a bridge made out of anything and change the rules of physics if they're bad, right? We have no real constraints on what we do. And the problem is, is that gives us no direction, right? So mechanical engineers have these like hard and fast rules where like you're not changing stuff but we can do anything. So we think about it a lot, right? This is the whole like talking about testing and talking about process and we like spend almost all of our energy uh, figuring out how we want to go about doing our job, right? It's like one step removed from actually doing our jobs. Um, you know, I've read like hundreds and hundreds of pages on how to test stuff. Not like actually doing testing, but just like thinking about how I might do testing someday when I do it. Um, <laughs> So, you know, there's a lot of that, that we have this anxiety because of our freedom um, that we have. And um, there's this concept called linguistic relativity. If you've read the Wikipedia page like I have, you'll know that it's called the uh, Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, but that's bad because they never work together and they never formed a hypothesis. That name is ridiculous. So the actual name is linguistic relativity. But um, there's strong and weak linguistic relativity. The strong mode says basically that like language determines the ideas that we have. And the weak mode says that language suggests things about the ideas that we have. So this is kind of like when people say you can write Java in any language. Um, this is what they mean, right? So if I have, um, 
if I have uh, like Clojure, for example, right, and I implement something in Clojure and I implement something in Ruby, those two solutions will probably look very different because the language of Ruby and the language of Clojure leads us towards certain conclusions, right? So in Ruby, we'll go towards a more OO path with a little bit of functional stuff sprinkled in, and in Clojure, we'll go down a hardcore functional path with maybe a little bit of object stuff sprinkled in, right? And it's due to the language shaping our perception of how we can build stuff. So. I think that when I think about this, I think about uh, this responsible mode versus this irresponsible mode, and maybe um, there are certain ideas that we can only we can only work on them effectively in irresponsible mode, and there are certain ideas that we can only work on in responsible mode. Right? Those ideas are like my software doesn't randomly break, and like I can rely on it. But in irresponsible mode, we have this like creative capacity that we wouldn't have whenever we're worrying about our unit tests or worrying about deployment or worrying about it working all the time. Um, so you can sort of think of this. Jim brought this up this morning, and I thought it was really good. Um, this sort of there's this TDD mode that you do most of the time, but then sometimes you get into this exploratory mode, right? Sometimes we just need to drop an IRB and not worry about unit tests and mess with stuff. So this is like the root of this irresponsibility and sort of the side that I'm advocating that we try to do a little bit more. Um, and so you can sort of see this talk. If Jim's talk was like all about TDD and a little bit about exploration, mine's like all about exploration and a little bit about TDD. And I think that that, that doesn't mean that one is better or worse than the other, just that we need to, be, we need to think about the fact um, that tests cannot describe every single problem, right? Tests will not catch every single bug. Um, so while tests are nice, like they're not always the end all be all. And TD is great. I love it. Frankly, like the reason I'm a Rubyist is because of testing. Um, my job before I became a Rubyist was in PHP, um, and we had deploy week, where, <laughs> where we deployed and then we fixed things for a week. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it was real bad. Um, so I'm like reading the internet, and I see this blog post about unit testing with Ruby on Rails. And I was like, I've heard of this Rails thing. What is it? Wait, I can write program? Oh my, ma, I quit my job. Like, <laughs> not immediately, but the writing was on the wall as soon as that happened. Um, so uh, yeah, so I think we need both modes of thought. So I'm here to advocate for the exploratory ridiculous mode, and we do need both of them. Um, so. Before we talk about the gem that I actually said my talk was going to be about, and what, I'm like a third of the way through, that turtle, yeah, halfway, um, let's talk about shoes. Uh, who here has heard of shoes before? I'm interested in the number of hands. Awesome. Uh, that's great. For those of you who don't know, um, shoes is one of Why the Lucky Stiff's projects that I took over. Um, basically, it's a way for you to write uh, GUI applications in Ruby. So this is Ruby Conf India, not Rails Conf India. So I thought it would be fun to sort of present a Ruby project, right? Because like Rails is great, uh, but not all Ruby code is for Rails stuff. And I think that I'm showing you shoes because, first of all, um, it's relevant to my topic, I swear. Um, I think that shoes with Frappuccino is an interesting combination, and it's the example that I will show you of how to use Frappuccino later. So first, you need to know how shoes works in order to know how to use Frappuccino with shoes. Um, but also, um, shoes has sort of been, um, that was that project that Y got burned out on, that I got burned out on. Um, and so uh, we are almost at a total rewrite Shoes 4 that is being released uh, hopefully soon-ish. And we actually have um, two students, well, so, Hackity Hack is the largest shoes application, so I'm sort of managing both projects. So we have one and a half students on shoes, and then two and a half students on Hackity Hack um, for Google Summer of Code and Rails Girls Summer of Code together. So um, shoes plus Hackity is like going to be coming back in a big way this year. And so hopefully, uh, when you need to build a desktop application, you will think about shoes in the future. Um, it's now all built on top of JRuby, which is super awesome, right? Um, so you get all of the goodness of all those things. So anyway, so I wanted to show you shoes as well um, because it's relevant and because it's coming back. So watch out for that. So now comes the live coding. I'm probably going to like break everything part where I show you shoes. So let's let's see how this goes. Live coding is always when when someone that is not Jim Wyrick live codes on stage is almost always bad. So uh, all right. So I'm going to open up a sample.rb file here in Vim. Is this? Uh, I think I maybe should make this a little bit bigger. We'll see. We'll see how this goes. Okay. So in shoes, the very first thing you need to know about is apps. 
So uh, what we do is we just say um, shoes.app do, and then an end, right? Can you guys see that? That's sort of really tiny. Let's see. Let's see if I can figure out how to make this bigger. Uh, I have, here we go. Let's try 20. Yeah, it looks like a little teeny bit bigger. It's hard to tell whenever you're uh, whenever you're about to go onto a screen, you know, what the what the size should be. Let's do 32. All right, awesome. That's pretty big. So, um, okay. So when you have shoes.app do, and I'll actually just run this from um, inside of here. So. Uh, all right, so shoes.app do end um, gives you a shoes app. It takes a minute because JRuby has an excellent startup time. Um, but <laughs> this, this is a pro this, it's worth it, but it, you know, it happens. So, uh, so this is like what happens. This is a native application. So in shoes, everything, um, so in shoes three, uh, it's all in I MRI, but in shoes four, it's JRuby. And this is actually a GTK um, application. On the Mac, it will be a native Cocoa application. And on Windows, it will bind to the Windows 32 API. But as you can see, it is uh, very full featured, this app. But you just, you know, you get that. Um, and you can pass it in parameters, so you can say, like, height is 600 or 500, because that's what I typed. Um, and it will change the heights. Um, and there's, like, titles and all sorts of other things. Uh, yeah, so anyway, so that's apps. Very simple. Now, the reason that I love shoes is because of buttons. Um, this is where I first was like, OK, sure, this is awesome. So, in order to build a button in shoes, um, let's change my shift width. To, no, it's, it's going to do eight anyway. All right. So um, you type a button, and then something like press me, do, and then an end. So when we run this, this now gives us a shoes app with a button. And the button says press me as the title. So you can see it's up here, a little tiny, and you can press it, right? Great. Super exciting. Um, but the thing about this is, if you've ever done desktop GUI development before, like this example, you're like, why is this interesting? But this would be like 150 lines of QT, right? Um, there's a thing I'll show you later where I implemented um, background gradients that Shoes has. And in Shoes, well, I'll just show you this right now, whatever. So in Shoes, if I wanted to set the background, I could say something like um, pound 000 to pound FFF. And theoretically, if I did this right, it will give me a gradient in the background of this thing. Um, yeah, right? So you get this real pretty black to white gradient. Now, thank you. Yeah. Um, so the thing about this is, so I was trying to, um, when we were deciding how to rebuild Shoes 4, um, I was working on this. And to implement this code with the, the um, range of like hexadecimal numbers was literally 60 lines of QT to implement that. Because you have to like instantiate two pen objects, and then instantiate two color objects, and associate the colors of the pens. Then you have to build a gradient object, and then you have to tell it how many points it's going to like shade over. And then you have to associate the pens with the ends of the gradients, and then you have to put it into the wind. It's just it's really excessive. Um, so anyway, all right, so buttons, I'm going to go a little bit faster now since you sort of get the idea. So we can say alert, good job. And uh, when we run this, um, as you can see with the button's name is the argument, but then the block gets executed whenever you actually do the pushing. So I say press me, and it pops up a thing that says good job, right? So this is super straightforward and easy. Um, and this is what I really love about it. It's just that it's like so straightforward. So we have paragraphs. Um, para, press the button, please. Um, and since this is taking a while to start up, I'm going to skip through to a couple of these. So edit line. So um, all right. So we can put in an edit line, which gives you uh, one of these input boxes that you may think like similar to HTML, right? So press the button, please, that para displays. And then uh, you know, we have this box that we can type stuff in. Um, and in order to use it, you can just assign it to an instance variable. So um, 
text equals edit line, and then you could actually like alert text.text. .text. And uh, so what this does is it saves a reference to our edit line. We can use the text method to actually get the text out of it. And then when this finishes starting up, hello, press me, and it says hello back, right? So it's just Ruby. You have blocks, you have instance variables, you have methods on stuff, but it lets you do all this really cool GUI stuff. I showed you background already. Um, we can hide things with the hide and show methods, um, and then animate is also really sweet. So animate gives you like a loop that happens over a certain period of time. All right, so that's shoes. So we're done with that. We're done with that part for now. Now you know shoes. Awesome. Uh, OK. So function reactive programming, theoretically, a little over the halfway point. I'm going to start talking about what I told you I was going to talk about. Um, so functional reactive programming. Functional reactive programming was originally a technique created in Haskell in order to deal with the fact that we need user interfaces, but Haskell is weird, right? <laughs> um, I love Haskell, but uh, it's definitely not what we're sort of like used to. Um, and so um, this guy named Kunal Elliott, uh, as my understanding is he's sort of the originator of it, but he put together this, uh, this idea called functional reactive programming. Um, and it builds on, as you would expect, functional programming and then reactive programming. Now, the reason I wrote, well, we'll get into that later. I'll talk to you about what it is first, and then I'll tell you why you should care. Um, so as you know, functional programming is this idea that we use functions as a first class concept, right? So you can make functions, um, make references to functions, pass functions to other functions. Uh, it's all about functions, right? And we do this in Ruby to a certain extent, right? Matt's built block. He knew that anonymous functions were awesome, and so we have a special syntax for anonymous functions in Ruby. Um, so we're sort of good on this front. And people often say, like, Ruby is an OO language with a bunch of functional things, right? If you've ever seen someone like write, tap, and inject, and you didn't want to strangle them, you probably did some functional programming before. Um, if you did want to strangle them, you probably hadn't. hadn't. Um, but um, you know, we're good. We're good with this in Ruby world. Reactive programming, though, is something that's totally different and interesting. So reactive programming um, basically has data flows as a first class concept in a reactive programming language. So what does that mean? Um, so we'll talk about that right after I say, functional reactive programming, therefore, is using first class functions to manipulate data flows. Two things together. Very simple. It says what it means. It means what it says. But that also doesn't really say anything, right? You're like, data flows, what, you know. So let's talk about it. What, what are those things? Um, so in Ruby, this is what would happen if you add two numbers together, right? So we assign a variable fa uh, a, we assign it the value 5, and then we say that b is equal to a plus 6. So when I check the value of b, it will print out 11. When I change a to 6, b is still 11, right? Like, that wouldn't make any sense. <laughs> As you can guess, in, in uh, like reactive programming, that's not actually true. So I use the colon here to sort of indicate that it's a little bit different than assignment. We sort of say that A is set to uh, the constant value 5, and then B is set to whatever A happens to be set to plus 6. So when we check out B, it'll be 11. But if we change A, that also changes the value of B. So this is what I mean about information flows. The, in, the, the value flows from A to B, because B has A as part of the like, definition of what B is. So this is sort of like Excel. If you've ever done programming in Excel, um, congratulations for still being here today. Um, <laughs> but my, so at one point I had a startup. I had a startup, and my business partner literally wanted to write a syntax highlighter for gedit for Excel macros. And I was like, he doesn't need to learn Ruby, man. And he's like, no, I got this. It's cool. Um, whatever. But so this is reactive programming. It's sort of this, these like data flows. Um, there's sort of three big concepts in functional reactive programming, and here's the big fancy words that you may see that involve them. So um, A and B in the instance are time-varying values, which sometimes are called behaviors or sometimes called signals. Basically what that means is you have a variable, but it sort of changes its value behind your back, right, over time. So something happens um, over time, and that changes things. Um, and then there's events. So events are anything that happens um, multiple times over time. Right? So we deal with events when we're doing like JavaScript stuff and things. Um, and then switching is this name for reacting to those events as they happen. So you sort of build up these time-varying values. You hook them up together via these flows. You uh, put events to make things happen. And then you just watch as all of the stuff you've like, orchestrated like, just works. Um, yeah. So 
I first became interested in FRP because this is my friend Philip. Uh, he, I went to a JavaScript conference because that's what I do. Uh, go to lots of conferences, and um, this particular conference was Real Time Conf EU um, in Lyon, France. Um, it was really, really awesome. Honestly, I was kind of surprised when they asked me to speak there because I sort of like talk a lot of trash on the real time web like all the times. So they were like, we want you to come and talk about Ruby stuff. And I was like, cool, I got to figure out what to talk about now. Um, but I really, really enjoyed it. And I really recommend that if you don't do things in other programming languages, that you visit other conferences for other languages or like read stuff about other languages. I'm doing a lot of work in Rust lately, for example, because I think that Rust is good at everything that Ruby is bad at. So that makes me want to learn it. Um, so, so go to JavaScript conference, and Phil is giving this talk about this uh, library called bacon.js. And uh, bacon.js is a functional reactive programming um, implementation in JavaScript. And I saw it, and I went, whoa, this is freaking awesome. Why don't we have this in Ruby? And then my brain said, FRP sounds like Frappuccino. And then I went, oh no, now that I have a good name, I have to write the gem. So like during his talk, <laughs> right, it, it never happens in that direction, right? This has happened to me like three times in my entire career where I've come up with a good name before I've actually done something. And every time it's always been like, oh man, another project. Like, like I don't have enough Ruby gems to worry about, right? Um, but so I was like, this is awesome. We should have this in Ruby. So I'm going to build it. So Phil is still talking, and I'm like spinning up a gem and like putting it on Travis and GitHub, and I'm like doing all that setup work, and I'm trying to copy the interface as he's giving examples because I thought it was so freaking cool. Um, but I didn't really know what I would use it for. I just thought it was neat, basically. Um, so that's sort of where Frappuccino came from as me going to this JavaScript conference. Um, and so. Um, the core thing that you do in Frappuccino is called streams. So basically what happens is you have some sort of object and you hook them up um, in data streams. So briefly, um, I'm going to show you, Phil, Phil has an awesome visualization of how he did stuff in JavaScript. And so I want to show you it really briefly in JavaScript because the visuals may help you understand. And then I'm going to show you in Ruby and Frappuccino instead. So I'm going to drag this over here. Because I just thought these were so gorgeous. Um, OK, so um, in this case, there's some sort of button, this minus one button, OK? And on the click of the button, it puts an event into the stream. So when I press the one, I get this event, right? And it just like pops into the stream of stuff. Isn't that cool? It's so good. Um, OK, and then um, you can do um, things like map over the stream. So in this case, every time I get an event, um, I map that to a negative one. So now instead of JavaScript objects, I'm getting minus ones. Then, uh, so there's this like plus one, minus one situation. So now I have two streams where when I push the plus one, I get a one. And when I push the minus one, I get a minus one, right? Just going to go through this again, yeah, real quickly. Um, and then uh, this is a little off the bottom of the screen. Let me drag this up. Oh, great. OK, cool. Well, apparently you can't see, so this is worthless. But um, it doesn't resize because, you know, who knows, CSS. Um, but basically, when I push the ones, it goes here. And then the minus ones uh, goes there. But then there's this like scores one that's in the bottom that shows both of those streams. So this merge turns these two streams into the one stream. And then uh, you can scan is like inject in Ruby. So now um, you know, the merged stream has both the ones and the minus ones. And the scan stream has the sum so far, which is off the bottom again, whatever. So I'm going to show you it in Ruby anyway. Um, and so then you can bind that to an output. So that sort of, that was the demo that I saw that I was like, this is freaking cool. So let's talk about it in Ruby now. Um, OK. So not sample, sample.rb, thank you. Um, actually, I'm going to do this instead. Stop. I'm so bad at Vim. It's, <laughs> it's terrible. Uh, because that has JRuby stuff, I'm going to leave it over here. And I'm going to make this one. Oh, not events yet. All right. So. Uh, Not sample, sample.rb. Thank you. OK, so, so in order to um, build this, uh, this stream in Frappuccino, um, you first require Frappuccino, because that's what you need to do. Um, 
And then I like to, I like to represent, you can do it without using classes, but I like to actually add classes um, into the mix a little bit. So I'm gonna make, thinking back to that example of the plus one, minus ones and the shoes with the buttons, I'm gonna make a button class. So we'll say class plus button, um, and then uh, we will make a push method on the plus button. And what it's going to do is it's going to emit a plus event into the stream. Uh, okay, so I have this thing, it, it emits a plus. That syntax highlighting is terrible, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, let me drag this out of the way and that might help a little team bit. Now, you may notice that we haven't defined the emit method anywhere, but it works, I swear. Like I said, irresponsible, we'll talk about that later. Um, but I can make a stream um, by not typing invalid characters and by typing, uh, frappuccino stream dot new, and then uh, plus button dot new, if I could spell. Okay, so now I have this stream object, and I've made it out of this button, which will emit events into the stream. But this by itself is not actually very useful. Um, so, what we can do is, um, yes, we have these events. So the events go into the stream and we can process them. So, um, so I have map, right? So uh, map is something that I can do to uh, the particular stream. So I can say stream.map. And then this, um, so we'll just name it E. We'll name it events. I won't be, I won't be that irresponsible. Um, and then uh, we can do anything we want with this event. So for example, I could say like, if event is equal to plus, um, you know, spit out a one, else make my tabs go crazy, spit out a zero, right? So this is, just, this is just your normal Ruby enumerable map. You get an argument, you do something with it, you spit something else out. But instead of it being over like an array, you're doing it over this stream of events. Um, and uh, we also have inject, too. So what I can do is that I can then take my, um, I can take my, on the end of my map, I can add an inject. Uh, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna start off at zero. And then I always forget what order this is in. It's the accumulator and then the number, right? I think. So uh, we take the accumulator and we add in the number that we get, right? So now, um, and I'm actually gonna assign this um, output equals this. So now we say, okay, if there's any, that we know that everything that's going to the stream is a number because the map, map stuff, um, man, that red is just terrible. So uh, my syntax highlighting is ruining my day. Um, yeah, there we go. Okay, so, and it's still off the bottom too. Man, all right. Cool, so we make a stream, we map the stream. If it's a plus event, we get a one, otherwise it's a zero. In this case, we don't have anything that could emit other stuff, but like, you know, it's always nice to check your edge cases, even when you're being irresponsible. Um, and then we inject and we sum the numbers that happen, right? So now this output is actually, um, it, it's a variable, but instead of it having a value like normal, um, we would put, now. So the now method fetches the current value of whatever output is, and if we uh, put in output.now, and then um, I actually need to save a reference. So this button equals, All right, so we save a reference to this button, and um, if I put the output, and then I do button.push, um, and then button.push, And then I put the um, output again and quit my Vim, apparently. Uh, thank you. Now instead of new. So when I run this code, assuming this works, which is a big assumption since I haven't run it all yet, um, when I run this, it should print out a zero, and then the pushes should emit, emit two events into the stream. Those should get summed up with the inject, and then it should print out a two, theoretically. Let's see if it worked. It did not at all, does not know how to load Frappuccino. Oh, because I installed it in the other Ruby. Uh, 
All right, we'll let that install for a second, because I'm going to show you some other stuff anyway. But it's in my JRuby, but not in my MRI. Um, the nice thing about giving your laptop away is that you get to reset up everything about all of your projects. Uh, you know, that's always fun. Um, OK, so whatever. We're just not even going to install this thing, because it's going to take forever on this Wi-Fi anyway. You, get the, you can trust me that it works, and you can download the code yourself. <laughs> um, all right, so like I said, you know, nobody's perfect. Um, all right, so we do have, though, Frappuccino plus shoes. So I want to show you um, over in the other terminal where I have JRuby with Frappuccino already installed, because I was doing this earlier, um, the button sample. I'm going to shorten this terminal so that I know where the bottom is. Um, OK, so I have this sample program. Uh, in shoes. Uh, I'm going to stretch this over a little bit more so you can see it. Part of the problem with making the font big is then it makes the uh, stuff sort of go off the edge of the screen. All right, so I guess first um, I'm going to run this so you can see what it looks like. So I have this little shoes app. It has a plus one and a minus one button, and it spits out the current count. Okay, So when I click plus one, it, it adds stuff. When I click minus one, it, it adds stuff. Right. So that's it. That's what we're building. So to do this in normal shoes land, um, we would um, add a stack, which means that they all stack on top of each other. And then we have a plus one button. We have a, a count instance variable that keeps track of our total count. And when we press the button, we want to add one to that count. And then we take our label and we replace the text with current count is the count. Um, and then with our minus one button, we subtract one from the count and we replace the label. And then we set up our instance variable to zero and we set up the initial text of that label. Right? So this is pretty easy to understand. But you can imagine that with a bunch of different buttons that have a bunch of different effects, you need to be keeping track of what the effects do in every button press. Right? So I'm duplicating this label replacement. Right? Every time I update the count, what this is really saying is I would like the buttons to modify the count. And when the count is modified, I would like to modify the label that goes along with it. Right? So remember that whole data streams thing where A goes to B and B is the value of A plus whatever? This is that exact kind of problem. Whenever the value of one thing changes, I want a different thing in the interface to change. So if we, instead of doing it the regular way, we do it the FRP way, um, so now um, I have this button class. Um, I want a plus button and a minus one button, so I metaprogrammed it slightly where I give the button the event that I want the button to emit. And then when I push, um, it actually does, it emits the proper event. So then we make our two plus and minus buttons. We make a stream out of them. We take that stream, and we, um, I made this convenience method map stream because those ifs get really annoying. So whenever it sees a plus event, I want it to emit a 1. Whenever it sees a minus, one, I want it to, or a minus event, I want to give it a minus 1. And whenever it's something else, I want it to be 0. And then I inject and sum up those numbers. Right. So this is sort of the same stuff that I showed you before. But what's really cool is, after doing that setup by saying, like, these are how everything is hooked up, the button just becomes a plus button dot push, and the minus button just becomes the minus button dot push. And then um, I make the label say what it wants, and then I do this animate block to essentially every second um, replace the value with whatever the counter is now. Right? So now we have this separate, like, separate section where the buttons only push the buttons in our code, and the labels get replaced at a particular time. So I'm going to run this really quickly to show you that it does the exact same thing. Sweet. Pluses and minuses, and it sums them up. Right? So in this small example, the code isn't significantly way better. But I can tell you, once interfaces grow, it can become really, really complicated to keep track of what is doing what. Right? So it's much, much easier to sort of treat the sources as the sources of events and then set up the destinations with like, the processing rules and just be done with it all at once. Um, there was a talk that was given a little earlier today um, that I missed, but the people who gave the talk were kind enough to show me the example afterwards of how they used the, uh, Frappuccino to actually uh, generate poetry. And what's really cool about it is that um, all the processing rules are right here. Right? These two lines give the whole algorithm for what we want to do with our events. So in this case, it's like mapping them to pluses and minuses and then summing them up. But that's basically what these two lines say. And all of our logic is in one place, whereas before it was split across our two previous buttons. 
All right. So anyway, um, I'm also going to show you the circle example really quickly because I want to do that. Um, so um, as another example of doing this with multiple kinds of events, um, so we have this clock. And we initialize it with a reference to the application. And then it starts off not being on. And then when we start the clock, it begins an animate block. And as long as the clock is on, it emits an integer. That's whatever the current second is. And then it also emits a started um, event and then sets on to true. On stop, it emits a stop event and it sets the instance variable to false. Um, so then in the app, I have a uh, circle. Um, and I set up a stream where the stream is based on this clock. And then um, if the, I do a select on the stream, right? So you know, select from enumerable fetches certain things. So the select selects um, if the event is a fixed num, which is those ticks of the clock we get ticks. And then um, whenever the ticks happen, um, every time we see a new value in the ticks, we move the circle via this math equation that doesn't matter. So please don't pay any attention to that. Uh, and then the start stop events, we take that same event stream, we select out only the string events, and then when we just print out, we put those to the console, right? So now our buttons do the same thing. Our clock starts and our clock stops, and that's it. All the rest of the processing rules are either in the clock class or in this streams uh, situation. And so what ends up happening then is we get this little app where I have this um, white circle on a black background. And when I click Start, it puts out a started to the console and starts moving the circle. And when I hit Stop, it prints Stopped to the console and stops moving the circle, right? So this is another like, toy example of this kind of stuff sort of working. Um, so anyway, um, Frappuccino contains the most irresponsible code that I've written lately. I am basically uh, almost out of time, so I am not going to show you what that is exactly, but let's just say that's what the emit method, like how does that emit method work, right? If you have some ideas, you can check it out, but it's kind of pretty really irresponsible. Um, so instead of showing you how that works, I would like to show you the other ridiculously irresponsible thing that I made lately, assuming that I didn't keep the uh, website up, so I'm assuming that uh, the Wi-Fi cooperates with me here real quick. All right, so uh, this is becoming. Oh, no, it's not going to show up. OK, so I'll just tell you anyway, because I don't want to fiddle with it. Um, so I wrote this gem. And by I wrote this gem, I mean Avdi did a screencast about it, and then I actually turned it into a gem um, called Becoming. And basically what happens is Becoming is uh, a Ruby gem where you can have your objects turn into other objects without changing their class. So if I make a new object and I include Becoming on that object, I get this method called Becoming where I can pass a reference to a module. And what Ruby will do is it will treat it just like you, you called extend, but it doesn't actually do extend. Because the problem with extend is it busts your method cache, and it also you can't unextend something, right? So in Ruby 2.0, uh, Ruby removed the restriction where if you have an unbound method that you can't rebind that method to a totally different class. So what the becoming gem done, it does is it adds the include, adds a method missing to your class that says, oh, if there's nothing called, if method missing gets hit, check and see if it exists on that module. And if it exists on that module, unbind the method from that module, rebind it to myself, and then call it, which is like completely ridiculous. Um, but it means that you uh, get this extension, and you can unextend objects. And also, if you've ever had the issue if you try to use presenters and Rails, everything works off the class name, right? Which is like really convenient most of the time, but it's really annoying when you want to like add a presenter because then you know URL for modifies the class name based on your presenters and all these other things. So uh, this lets you modify classes without uh, changing their names, which is useful sometimes. So. Anyway, I'm now out of time. As you can see, the tortoise has crossed over the line. So uh, I just wanted to say thank you for listening to me ramble about irresponsibility, about Frappuccino. Um, play around with it. See if there's fun stuff you can do. I think that there's lots of interesting, creative things that we could do with a library like this, but I don't know. I just built it for fun. 
Um, so please be creative in your, you know, not necessarily at your job, but at least at home. Um, do things that you might think that are bad, because if we do things that are bad, sometimes really good stuff happens out of them, right? So you can have happy accidents. Um, and let's, let's like go together and have fun with Ruby instead of being so serious about it all the time, all right? So thank you. Okay, time for some irresponsible questions. I should leave this in in case. All right, I mean, whatever. But. Hey, uh, great talk. Thank you. Uh, and I buy, buy what you're selling about two modes of being irresponsible and irresponsible. <laughs> Uh, my question is, what if one guy is in, oh, I have to stand up for my face to appear there. <laughs> okay, so what if one guy is trying to be in responsible mode and he runs into a gem which someone else wrote in an irresponsible mode? How, yeah. how do you communicate that bit? <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the spirit of irresponsibility, I haven't thought that through that much yet. No. Um, <laughs> I mean, you could argue, you could argue that like active support, for example, is like terribly irresponsible, right? But we still use it all the time. So I think that, I think that the trick is to allow the creativity of the moment of not worrying about things like TDD. So for example, when I built Frappuccino, this is what I, I sort of alluded to, but I never finished saying. When I built Frappuccino, like there are tests for all of it. But they're, they're acceptance tests so that I know that the code I worked writ, uh, that I wrote worked properly, but it didn't, I didn't let the, let the tests guide my implementation because that would have been too much constraints on my creativity. So I think that it's important that we, we do it irresponsible at the beginning in order to generate those interesting ideas and then develop more responsible versions of them later, right? So when I built this library, like it's possible that um, I've heard from some people that they like how it works, but imagine that I built it and the code was terrible and it was bad, but the idea was really good. We can take that idea and then build a responsible version later. So I think that might be the correct answer is that like at the beginning we need to be more irresponsible and towards the end we need to be more responsible. The trick is not to be so irresponsible that it's impossible to become responsible eventually <laughs> which is what happened with shoes and that's why we're rewriting all of it so hey thanks for the talk uh, yeah. I've been meaning to ask this where is why and what is he doing right now so uh, I'm actually going to be giving a talk at Madison Ruby this year about that topic exactly um, so you can watch the eventual video to get the full details but to not uh, to not get too far into it, basically, um, you have to remember that Y is a, uh, a character. So there's like the person, uh, and then there's the role that he played, which is Y. So this person invented this role that we all really, really enjoyed, but they decided that they did not want to perform that role anymore. So what happens is, is they abandoned it with the intention that we would take it up and continue doing these cool things. And some of us have and have tried to, and like the spirit of why obviously carries on. This is the reason that I'm you know, still talking about this stuff and why you clap when I mention his name, right? Um, but uh, what happened was uh, he decided to eventually come back and tell us uh, what he's doing, and basically what the answer to that is, not the programming stuff. Like, and that doesn't mean no programming at all, but in terms of like being why the lucky stiff, he has abandoned that entirely, but he wants us to pick up what he left off and to like carry on with the spirit. Like we all should be why the lucky stiff for like half an hour or an hour a day. Um, but you shouldn't be why the lucky stiff all the time because then you'll end up committing info suicide, right? So, um, so that's sort of like what he's doing now doesn't really matter because the character is all of ours and it's us to decide what Y is doing nowadays. The person is off doing their own personal stuff and, and we, shouldn't, we should like them for the fact that they gave us this character and this guidance, but they're not like, you know, they're doing their own thing and we should respect the privacy of whatever they chose to do. Which is perfect, but uh, you know, given that he destroyed his online presence, I don't know whether he kind of harmed himself in any way in a similar fashion. The funny thing about destroying your own interest, so uh, he like, Thank he you. knew that Git existed, so he did destroy everything sort of, but he also knew that we could keep all of it. So there's sort of this weird thing where like, you know, I think that was to indicate the severity, but it was not like, I do not feel bad continuing to use wise code and ideas, I guess, even though he destroyed stuff. Because I was just saying like, I am gone, so.
I don't know. We can talk about it more later. Uh, you know, I can give you all the details, but that's sort of the summary. Thanks, Steve. Uh, great talk. Uh, it's like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Same thing. Yeah, you're under the lights. Awesome. <laughs> so uh, good to hear about shoes, like because Ruby lacked uh, really desktop building uh, sort of an uh, API or DSL. So are you using Java Swing underneath? Uh -huh. oh. It's using SWT actually. So okay. we we're building it. We're building it so that. Um, there is the like DSL is implemented in pure Ruby, and there are backends. So the first backend is SWT, okay. um, actually. But we would like for it to eventually be possible for you to even write an MRI backend okay. using, you know, maybe uh, using the uh, QT, or QT, yeah, QT, any of the other bindings. But the first, the MVP is building SWT backend. Yeah. And is, is it on GitHub? Like yeah, so if you want to check out Shoes, uh, the sh website is shoesrb.com, but the GitHub repo is shoes slash shoes4, because we're building it all in a brand new repository, and then we'll merge them together once shoes4 is actually released. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you for reminding me. I should have said that um, earlier. So. Hi, Steve. Hello. Uh, how does the now method work, and how did you make it performant? How does the what work? I'm now. Sorry. Oh, how when does now work? When you, when you pull uh, out the value? So basically, um, all of this is implemented in terms of Ruby's observers. So you can actually check it out. The actual source code for Frappuccino is like uh, on the order of like 150 or 200 lines. But basically, um, when you make a stream, it inserts an observer on the stream and on the object and then sets them up so they're linked. So it's actually all just like a chain of observers that pushes stuff. And the, the actual implementation of now is like, return the instance variable value, so it's pretty quick. But yeah, that's, that's the basic gist of it. Cool. If you have any more questions, please catch Steve later. He's going to be here for some more time. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Thanks a lot, Steve.